we are live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Yes. Good evening and welcome to the fifty seventh webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society. Uh, today there is a slight change in the program. Professor Scott Cousin could not join due to some unavoidable uh, reasons. So we have two experts from India, Dr. Premal Nayak and Dr. Viraj Singade. They are going to take lectures on the same topic, radial nerve sinusosis and medullary deformity. So Viraj is, uh, is, is like very popular and I don't think that he requires both Premal and Viraj, they don't need any introduction. Viraj is practicing in Nagpur and he has a keen interest in neglected club foot and radial nerve sinusosis. And he has a publication in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedic. Similarly, Premal also has a quite uh, an ex extensive experience with radial nerve sinostosis and med lung deformity. So first of all, Viraj is going to share his views about radial nerve sinostosis. Over to you, Viraj. Uh, thank you, Dhiramai, for those kind words. Am I audible? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically, I was uh, supposed to uh, just uh, present a case on radial nerve sinusosis. So it was not a, I was not supposed to deliver a talk. So just a short presentation I made. But I will just try to elaborate most of the points which are relevant in terms of the radial nerve sinusosis. And being a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, what are the most of the things uh, we face in day to day life? That is what we are going to discuss today. Okay. So, I always say that uh, uh, when we were postgraduate, we were told that if you get a case of congenital proximal radial nerve stenosis, you should just tell the patient that, that nothing is possible and, uh, and we should just forget about it. Because uh, the previous surgeons or the previous attempts uh, which, uh, where the people tried to either separate the fusion site or they uh, try to impose some kind of uh, some tissues in between the radius and ulna so that uh, the refusion should not occur. They fail miserably. And there are many papers in which there were, there were in fact, compartment syndrome. There were many neurological damages also. And so the ultimate uh, uh, inference was that um, and nothing much, uh, I mean, happens if the child has a radial nerve stenosis. And this is a condition where it should be just left like that. But I completely disagree with this because when I started working, because I work in an area, Central India, where there are a lot of tribal population here. And we do get a lot of all kinds of neglected cases and all variety of cases. I found that definitely the child who is having the congenital radial nerve stenosis, particularly I'm talking about the Indian context or the context where people still eat the food with the hand by the right hand, you require a full supination to eat the food, as well as <clears throat> you require a full pronation to take the food from the plate. Similarly, by the non-dominant hand, when you try to clear the perennial hygiene, you need to take the water from the tap. So for that, again, you require a full supination. And for cleaning, you require a full pronation. So the basic activity of life, right, from eating and cleaning the perennial area, these are the two very basic important activities of the human life and they require the full supination as well as the pronation. So it is very wrong to say that if somebody having, is having the congenital proximal radial nerve stenosis, you should just forget about it. I think this concept itself is wrong because then you are not giving quality of life to the patient, right? And that is how we work. We, we started working, we pull out the literature and then we started working anatomically and then we come up uh, with a new, a very simple solution for this difficult problem. And I call this as a single stage rotational osteotomy for congenital proximal radial nerve stenosis. And it is a very, very simple. I, uh, the reason why I it call it as a simple solution, I'll just come through the, this short presentation what I have. So what is the simple solution? The technique is we cut the ulna proximally, just one to two centimeter distal to the fusion site. So the ulna is osteotomized. This is called as rotational osteotomy. Okay, so we have to osteotomize the ulna as well as radius both. And then we have to give the rotation 
we have to bring the forearm into functional position and that is how it improves the quality of life so what we do we do the osteotomy just distal to the fusion side for the ulna and for the radius we osteotomize at diaphyseo metaphyseal junction so it is a distal osteotomy is for the radius okay now once we osteotomize we just close the subcuticular tissue and the skin we don't i mean uh, close the fascia or too tight the peris we don't try to uh, suture the periosteum as well and no implants are required we don't fix it we just bring the forearm after closure into 30 degree of supination 20 to 30 degree of supination and just we apply the plaster a boil of plaster okay now with this simple technique the next question arises why not why not pronation why only supination so friends if you know the anatomy very well we know that the forearm function depends upon the degree of compensation at shoulder as well as at waist so what we basically if and if you see the anatomy that if you try to close the forearm and elbow if you try to take the elbows close to your chest wall and then try to do the supination and pronation you will find that there is only 90 degree of supination and 90 degree of pronation which is possible but as soon as you release the elbow from your chest wall and then you see anatomically there is a big compensation from the shoulder so the supination is possible only up to 90 degrees while the pronation is possible beyond that so it is an almost around 145 degree you can pronate it because the more compensatory movements are possible for the pronation as compared to supination from the shoulder now this is a anatomy of an any human being so there is more compensation possible for the pronation but not for the supination and that is why after doing the osteotomy we bring the forearm into the 30 degree of supination so that the child will have the all activities of the supination so what is the need of indian population as i told that we require dominant hand full supination for taking the food to the mouth and from taking food from the plate you require full pronation by the dominant hand similarly for the non dominant hand we require then i am i am audible na yeah please yeah, yeah, yeah. you are audible for the for the non dominant hand again to take the water from the tap we require the full supination and again to clean the peripheral area we require a full pronation right so this is a normal requirement for for any asian population or any indian person and for that that is why we say that you have to after surgery you have to bring the forearm into the supinate position now this is a study what we performed the way back we started this study almost in 2006 and then it, the the paper was published for the good follow up we then published and now we have a, a more larger series than uh, this I, i mean say almost more than double the series what we had we published in the paper and we have almost now 15 years follow up over most of the cases those we operated in the past so majority of the osteotomies they united within 5 weeks period and in this study what we are given the we have asked a different 12 activities subject evaluation where we ask the question to the parents that this activity is possible by the child or he has any difficulty and all those activities which were not possible before surgeries all of them they become possible after surgery all there was not a single patient in which the difficulty which was there before surgery which persisted last so all the activities which were not possible before surgery they became possible after surgery so this was about the subject evaluation and as far as the object evaluation was concerned we perform the object evaluation by doing the jefferson teller hand function test and morris et al activities so the time which was required by to do the jefferson teller hand function test was significantly reduced so there was a significant improvement for each and every patient what we operated right and in fact there was a good uh, there are 15 different set of morris activity which has been described by the morris and that is how they describe the hand functioning all the activities which were not possible or they were have difficulty in performing some activities they become possible or they have no difficulty after surgery in all of these cases okay so the results were excellent as far as the concerned technique is concerned so the illustrative example is here this is a child he has a 
congenital proximal radial lung stenosis of the left upper limb right upper limb is normal and you see after surgery the amount of supination what he has so if you see the video of this child before surgery you compare both the things so the supination was not possible and after surgery now the full supination as well as pronation which is possible right from composition from the shoulder so basically we are bringing the forearm into the more functional arc we are not separating the fusion side we are not touching the fusion side but we are bringing the forearm into more functional position so all the activities like eating and taking food to the mouth and all everything became possible after surgery and this is a 13 year follow up of the same child you can see there are certain question the people ask that what about the function of if you bring the forearm into supination what will happen to their pronation function he is a biker he this child he just love to ride the bikes and then he do lot of stunts with the bikes so he is able to for now for biking you need to have a very uh, good pronation as well as a good function of that good strength also so you can see the strength of this child what has and and see the supination also he has a full supination he has no functional restriction as far as the supination as well as the pronation is concerned this is another case this child she had a bilateral congenital radial lung stenosis now and you see this is we first operated a right upper limb for her and this is a left upper limb so so if you see the uh, left upper limb now see right upper limb which was operated compare the right upper limb to the left side now this right side now she had a full supination which is a compression from the shoulder and then when you compare the both the limbs you see the right and left which was before surgery which were like this she had difficulty in supination in all the activities the so supination was not possible now the right upper limb which was operated there is a full supination full pronation she is able to take the food to the mouth very easily and you compare the difficulty on the left side which is non operated side see the holding the plate from the right upper limb so if you go to any function and if you are eating the food in a buffet you need to first hold the plate into in a good position so she is now able to hold the plate in good position and see the difficulty what she has with the <coughs> non operated left upper limb then see the pronation activity see the writing so the people ask what will happen to the pronation and this is the example <coughs> she is able to write and do all the activities of pronation fully the scarring which is there the scar is very minimal and see the functional videos before surgery surgery of right upper limb surgery of other side also so the <coughs> and again 10 year follow up of the same girl there are certain questions which people raise that what about the keyboard playing or the activities of typing so naturally i can't say that just touching the <coughs> elbow to the shoulder or uh, sorry to the abdomen or the chest wall the child the person will have little degree of the uh, composition which will be required that very fine activities they might have to take the elbows little apart but other than this they will not have any difficulty as far as the activity of the pronation is concerned because there is a good compensatory moment of pronation which is possible from the shoulder so the advantage of this surgical procedure procedure is it is single stage less expensive it is effective and gives very good correction and the function and it very important it suits to the need of our patient and it improves the quality of life and advantage of this condition or this uh, particular surgery over the other surgical option is that you don't need to require any flaps so you don't need a microvascular surgeon and the other expensive procedure like elizor and all they are they, this is very simple and single stage procedure what about and complication we had only one delayed union and i would recommend to do this surgery as early as possible when the child is about 2 and half to 3 years he is able to understand and cooperate you you should do it because then no fixation no implants are required one patient we had a persistent bump for some period of time again but she functionally had no problem and gradually that also improved so i would recommend if you are op op operating below 15 or below 14 nothing like that 
because it gives a quality of life to so many patients. What about adults? We have operated now quite a few of adults also. Those who insisted me, we had a congenital radius sensors to do something. So what we do in these cases, the incidence are at the mid shaft of the level and <clears throat> the osteotomy is more at the mid shaft level. We need to fix the osteotomy. We just don't leave them uh, just on the basis of plaster. We have to fix them with the, with the help of either Recon or the forearm DCP. And sometimes in one or two patients, we added a graft also because we found that there are tremendous tension in the system. So we have to put a graft so that it should not increase any chance of non-union. And this is a functional video. So this technique work equally good in terms of adult, right? And with due risk, you have to explain that if at all, some, somebody may have a chance of non-union if you are not very precise about the surgery. And it is how it gives a quality of life. There may, uh, if time permits, uh, shall I show the video, intro video, operative uh, video? Viraj, uh, Dr. Yeah. Scott has already joined. So uh, we will yeah, take yeah. his lecture first and then we will go for uh, discussion. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, welcome, Scott. Uh, sorry for like some confusion. No, I, I couldn't find the password. It's my fault. Fine. Uh, can you... Uh, share your presentation on the radio ulnar sinostosis first. Yep, give me one second. Let me go find it. Whoops. Give me one second. Now I've messed it up. You, you don't see it yet, do you? Because I can't see it. Yeah, because we are just seeing the zoom part. Yep, let me try and find it. You see, and it's opening up now. Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it widescreen now? Yes, full screen. Yeah. Okay. Please. So again, I apologize for being a few minutes late trying to find the password. So I was asked to speak about synostosis, just like Viraj just spoke about, and a lot of the discussion will be a little bit repetitious, but we approach a little bit different, which I think will be interesting. I'm going to speak about two things, actually, both radial humeral synostosis that you see with ulnar deficiency, and then the proximal radial ulnar joint synostosis, which Viraj just spoke about. I think the first and foremost is how do you communicate this to parents? And what I tell parents is as follows, is our joints form in utero by cavitation, like a waterfall. So they cavitate to form the joint, and then they move to maintain the joint. So if they don't cavitate, they don't form a joint, and that's a synostosis. If they don't move, for example, the child on the right with arthrogryposis, they end up being stiff. So it's a very simple way to explain it to parents. Cavitation and movement is necessary for joint <clears throat> production. With reference to radial humor synostosis, it tends to be radial humeral and is associated with ulnar deficiency. And the radial ulnar, which we'll speak about secondly, tends to be proximal, although the extent of the synostosis varies. With reference to radial humeral synostosis, if the classic is a ulnar deficiency child, and the classic position is the hand is on the flank. So this is an example of the position of the limb facing backwards. If you see it bilateral, you need to be concerned of what's called ulnar mammary syndrome. And a genetic analysis is worth the while because it's an autosomal trait that can be passed on to their children. I think the treatment has changed for me over the last 20 years. So I, I used to try and address the hand on flank by rotating the hand in front of them for a more functional hand. Now I do nothing. I treat them with benign neglect. And you may ask, why do you treat them with benign neglect? Because I've learned over time that these kids will rotate their limbs. So this is Max. He does have ulnar mammary syndrome. So he has bilateral ulnar deficiency. And you can see his right hand is facing backwards. The classic hand on flank. His radius is fused to his distal humerus. But if you look at his movement patterns over time, he somehow derotates his arm enough where he can touch his nose. He can reach behind his head. 
He can bring his hand in front without any surgical intervention, despite the hand initially facing backwards. And then I think what you need to do is you need to challenge these kids. So I said to Max, listen, Max, next time you come back in the office, I want to see your tie or shoes. I, want, I don't want any more Velcro sneakers. So this is Max at a yearly follow-up. And lo and behold, despite his owner deficiency with two fingers on each side, he is able to tie his shoes. And this is the one with the Velcro. And he can put on his shoes without difficulty. So these kids are resilient. And a little bit of a challenge goes a long way. This is better than challenging them with a surgical intervention, but challenging them on a personal basis. I want to show you one other example. Uh, this is Luke, another child with bilateral ulnar deficiency. Uh, we did do polarizations of his thumbs, as you see here, but his hands are both facing backwards. Here he is early on, bringing his hands in front, touching the top of his head, touching his ear, maybe different than you and I touch our ear, but nonetheless able to touch his ear. And here he is touching his other ear. So Luke was challenged in a little bit different format. I said, Luke, next time I want you to see you in the office, I want to see you get dressed by yourself. So he comes in a year later. Here's Luke putting on his belt. And if you notice, he's focused on doing this task. Again, building resiliency in kids, especially those that have a difference, is extremely important. And you can see Luke focused on putting his belt on. And we're obviously filming him put his belt on to, to drive home how important it is for him to put his belt on. And he's almost done. And then when he's done, unbeknownst to us, he's going to give a little bit of a bow. So like I said before, ulnar deficiencies with hand on flanks, radial humeral synostosis, I no longer bring around the front. Now, moving on to what we just spoke about earlier, I think the forearm joint is the forgotten joint. It really is a bicondylar joint with a proximal radial ulnar joint and a distal radial ulnar joint and a membrane or interosseous membrane in between. It's extremely similar to the knee, if you think about it. There's ligaments on both sides and there's an anterior cruciate, which is your interosseous membrane. I love the form. I think it's a fascinating joint to talk about. There are two muscles that yield supination, your biceps and supinator. They tend to be innervated by C5, C6 and two muscles that yield pronation. The pronator teres is a big C7 muscle, and the pronator quadratus is a C8 and T1 muscle. And the forearm joint gets imbalanced in a lot of the impairments that we see. So for example, kids with spinal cord injury tend to get stuck in supination. Kids who have a global brachial plexus palsy with recovery of C5, C6 tend to get stuck in supination. Initially, it's passively correctable, and over time, it becomes a fixed deformity for a variety of reasons. In terms of rotation, again, how do you describe it to parents? I tell parents the radius is a curved bone, like a bucket handle on a bucket, and the radius rotates around the bucket, just like a bucket handle. For that to occur, the radius needs to have a bow. It needs to have the flexors, I'm sorry, the supinators and the pronators, and the ulna needs to be straight. And any disturbance in that problem in that sequelae will lead to problems with forearm rotation. Now, as Viraj mentioned, supination tasks include feeding, washing their face, catching a ball underhanded, using a, using a soap dispenser, and wiping their butt. Compensation is intercarpal rotation and shoulder adduction, just like was mentioned previously. For pronation tasks, they tend to be tabletop activities such as keyboarding, writing, and all the tabletop stuff we do like cutting meat. And the compensation is again by intercarpal rotation and shoulder abduction. If you look at normal intercarpal rotation, it's give or take 30 degrees. In kids with synostosis, they can increase that intercarpal rotation up to 60 degrees. Hence, the diagnosis of synostosis is often delayed till somewhere about three, four, five, six years of age because they're able to compensate by intercarpal rotation. Now, those patients obviously in extreme synostosis, extreme pronation supination are diagnosed earlier than those that are in mid position or semi supination or semi pronation. How does it occur? It can be sporadic or it can be inheritable. It can be associated with a variety of syndromes. Most of the kids we see do not have these syndromes, but it's important that can be bilateral in 50% to make sure you look at the other side. 
In addition, I've learned over time, there is this continuum from normal to abnormal, with abnormal being synostosis and normal being full, full form rotation. And there are those kids who have a synostosis on one side, and although they don't have a synostosis on the other side, they don't have normal pronation supination. It can be 50 or 60%. Again, I think it's just this continuation of joint cavitation and movement in utero. <clears throat> just like Viraj just mentioned, op operations to restore form rotation have failed. We no longer try to restore form rotation. We have tried over the years, including such drastic techniques as free tissue transfer, but they're uniformly unsuccessful. In joints that were fused in utero, no matter what the early release is at surgery, they tend to reform a synostosis. Operations to reposition the form are successful. We don't do a proximal ulna and distal radius. We tend to, do, to indicate, to uh, divide the synostosis mass. The surgical indications are this extreme supination or extreme pronation, like you see the child on the left. Anybody that drinks their bottle backwards is stuck in pronation, and this left side underwent early surgical correction. Our technique, uh, we make an incision directly over the synostosis. We place a large stymen pin in the ulna first. We then mark the bone and, ro de and rotate the bone either in the supination or pronation. We then advance the longitudinal wire and add an oblique wire. And I'll show you this in a video. And then here's the final x-ray, depending upon how much form rotation that they require. We also prophylactically release the fascia, both dorsal and volar. So this is Trey. He's a seven-year-old with synostosis on the left side, which you'll see in a second. So his right side has normal forearm pronation and supination. His left side is stuck in pronation. He's unable to supinate past neutral. He has a fairly large synostosis from proximal to distal. As I said previously, this is variable. Uh, we mark out the synostosis, and in fluoroscopy, we mark out where the coronoid is and where the beginning and end of the synostosis is before we start. Under tourniquet control, it's a straightforward incision right down to the synostotic mass. Right, this does not take long. And then you identify the ulna by subperiosteal dissection. You just work your way around the synostosis. You have to be aware that the postsynerosis nerve is in close proximity and you need to take your time. Now we're putting the longitudinal ulnar wire in first to make sure it's an adequate position. All osteotomies are just about set up. We've marked the bone. We're going to cut the bone. We technically take a small lifesaver waiver out of the bone, as you see here, to decrease the tension on the soft tissues, which allows as much correction as you possibly need. This is the lifesaver piece of bone being removed. And now you can put the form wherever you want. You decide the adequate position, which tends to be a little bit of pronation. In some cases, it's a little bit of supination. It just depends upon whether they're bilateral or one side. The K-wire is advanced across the synostosis that's now been cut. We recheck the position. Here's the K-wire that now goes down the ulna and into the <laughs> distal bone. And here's your oblique wire with the offset. An important part of the operation is to release the fascia prophylactically, just to make sure there's not undue swelling. Here's adequate position. Here's the fascia being released, both dorsal and volar, to allow, accommodate for swelling. And then subsequently, Trey is placed into a cast that's split and then recovered uneventfully. In the older kids, just like Viraj mentioned before, we tend to use internal fixation. Uh, this is Nino. You do need to understand that in kids older than eight, there is an increased incidence of a posterior and osseous nerve palsy. So in, in those cases, you may want to consider a, a proximal and distal osteotomy. Uh, we did, there's, this is Nino's x-ray. Here he is, here he's bilateral, left and right. We operate on his left side. Here's the rotation being fixed. Take a life, life saver piece of bone out. And in this case, we did use internal fixation. 
Remember, the most feared complication is compartment syndrome. And in children, it's the A's and not the P's. So it's increasing analgesia, agitation, where they're anxious. You just can't miss it. The nice thing about the K-wires is if they develop these symptoms of K-wires, the oblique K-wire can simply be removed and they can be under rotated to allow for a, a decreased amount of correction. But this is the most feared complication in our practice. Other complications, which I all hate, are the posterior osseous nerve. You just need to be extremely careful if you decide to cut through the synostatic mass. Obviously, if you perform the technique proximal and distal, there's less chance of posterior osseous nerve injury. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, so uh, we will have a few minutes for the discussion and then we will go for the second lecture. So uh, the technique of uh, both the surgeons are different. And Premal, you also have a different view about uh, uh, managing the radio ulnar sinusosis. So can you briefly tell us about your method and then we will discuss which one is better or the advantage and disadvantage of each one? So I think I have a very, very different uh, technique. Uh, there's a Japanese paper which came out in, I think, uh, 2003 or 2004 in JPO. And from that, I have learned that uh, you don't need to cut two bones. You can just cut the distal radius. As you mentioned, that it is the radius, which is the rotating bone, like a bucket handle and the bucket stays there. So from the same principle, <clears throat> I don't do anything to ulna. Distal radius at the metaphysis is exposed. And with um, a series of K-wire uh, drills, we, I cut the bone. In young kids, I would just repair the periosteum and, and put a cast in supination. In older kids, I, I tend to put a K-wire, but that K-wire is quite thin. Uh, it just maintains the alignment of the radial pieces so that uh, you know it doesn't look very bad at the end of the plastering bone. And still, it can allow somewhat rotation. And we try to I try to put it in maximum supination as possible. Uh, that just turns out to be uh, adequate supination because, uh, as Viraj mentioned, uh, loss of pronation is a little well tolerated compared to uh, supination. Because in India, there is one another very important uh, function which you need to go. When you go to temples, you are given some sweets, which is now known as a prasad. And you have to take it in your supination. And I have seen a lot of patients uh, were diagnosed when they couldn't do that, as mentioned earlier. That uh, you mentioned that because of the intercarpal rotations, many patients don't come up uh, early. And this is one of the functions which parents noticed that that child couldn't do it and then they were brought to. So it's a little different take. Uh, but it's very well reported. It's nothing new that I've, I've done. I followed the Japanese technique and it has worked really well in more than 50 patients I've offered. Yeah, so Scott, what are your views about this uh, surgical technique or the method which uh, Premal described? Yeah, I just have a question. If, if the radius is bowed and you cut the radius and you rotate the radius, why, why, why do they not just totally malalign? Yeah. It always malaligns actually and it remodels very well over a, over a year. So that is always told to the parents that... Uh, and the distal forearm is going to look a little awkward, but in, in, in a year's time, it remodels beautifully well. As you know, that distal radius remodels very well. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, whenever you have derotated, in how many percentage of cases you had to go back to the operation theater and derotate it back? Yeah. Your oblique wire and get some correction back. I mean, do some no, correction and be safe. Yeah, I've not had to take a single patient back. Okay. Yeah, that's what is my experience has been. Yeah, I, I mean, we talk about it and we teach it, but I've not had to take a single patient back for a compartment syndrome. I have had uh, two cases of temporary postenorosis nerve palsy, uh, one an older kid and one a younger kid. The younger, the younger kid recovered completely. The older kid had some persistent lag at his MCP joints. So I am very careful about that postenorosis nerve. It seems as we get older, we can tolerate less rotation. So one more thing I've realized in doing distal radius osteotomy is that whenever you derotate it, there is always a forearm, uh, the forearm muscles stretch out and there is a finger flexion, which I generally I incorporate in a plaster. Otherwise, you know, kids cannot extend their uh, fingers and that causes worry to the parents. 
So post-operatively, I tend to see that I put uh, my cast uh, beyond uh, at least uh, proximal interphalangeal joint. So that there's only a little infection possible. Otherwise, they'll curl up their fingers and the parents will be a little worried that they are not able to fully extend their fingers. Yeah, that would really scare me, right? Because then I wouldn't know if the radial nerve is working or not. I just have to trust that it's working, right? But I don't, I just put them into a cast that allows early finger range of motion. So our therapist can work on any extrinsic finger tightness. But I maybe it's because I take a little wafer out. Maybe that lessens the tension across the muscle. But they, they do start early motion once they're comfortable, actually. I think it's interesting. It's um, it's almost like the analogy. There's more than one way to skin a cat, right? There's different ways to treat this problem. I think the consensus, though, is that none of us believe that you can restore any range of motion. I think that's for the audience. That's the take-home point. You know, whether you cut the radius, whether you cut the radius, and you all know whether you cut through the synostosis mass, all that is an appropriate treatment. You just can't try to restore motion. It's a total waste of time. So, Scott, can I ask a question? This is Sandeep here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so uh, we see a lot of synostosis where the radial head is actually dislocated anterior or posterior. And mm -hmm. I've had the instance of excising the head because it creates a extension block and recurrent synovitis. And uh, do you have any experience with that? A simple operation like excising the radial head towards maturity restores their flexion extension without impingement. Because every time the synostosis may not be symmetrical, the radial head actually is oblique and it continues to grow and causes either a flexion or an extension block. No, I think it's a great question. So we've had similar experience. You know, the, the, it's interesting. The radial heads that get in trouble or cause discomfort are the ones that kind of edge load a little bit. If the radial head is way out in a different zip code, it doesn't seem to bother the patients, but if they're edge loading, so if they're anterior, for example, and they're loading Sandeep and deflection, that's one case. If they're, yeah. if they're posterior lateral, but they're kind of edge loading on the capitellum, that leads to irritation, denuding of the cartilage, and then synovitis. Yeah, I, t I agree. Like you see with nail patella syndrome is classic, right? With nail patella syndrome, what you'll see is the, the radial heads that are way out, that's not a problem. But the radial heads that are edge loading, they're problematic. And, and for the audience, so some of the radial heads that are anterior, they're so anterior, you have to perform an anterior Henry approach to go get the radial head. Yes. I think that's a safer way, right? Because then you're going to find the Just next to the median nerve, you have to go and it's right there. But they get exactly. tremendous relief after surgery. Yep, agreed 100%. Yep, just go find that radial nerve. I think it's not, I think it's a, it's a type 4 radial synostosis in which there is a radial head dislocation and the radial head is well formed. Most of the time, the radial head is not well formed and it is fused with the proximal ulna. So, when yep. the radial head is uh, well formed and when it juts out anteriorly, it, it uh, irritates the uh, brachialis tendon. And that is where, uh, sorry, biceps tendon. And that is where you get reflection block as well as extension block. And I, I have two patients like Sandeep mentioned. The only treatment here works is your hand raise approach and radial head dislocation. Yeah. Yeah, I had on a longer follow up, one of my patients developed a distal ulnar uh, growth arrest. That child had a bilateral uh, radiolar synostosis, operated on both sides, was lost to follow up, and after 10 years came with a distal ulnar uh, physial arrest and, and radial had tilting. So I had to do this radial osteotomy to correct uh, radial tilt. So I, I went through the literature. It's not reported in radial ulnar synostosis. Any experience, Scott? I don't I, I don't understand why they developed a distal ulnar physial arrest. I've, I've never, I, I'm not, I've never seen it, but it may have seen me. But why do you think they developed a distal ulnar growth arrest? There was no history of trauma and uh, child gradually developed a deformity and that's why they came back to me. Unfortunately, I had not touched ulna in that case as I never do anything on the ulna. And on the other side, the child was operated with the same surgery, had no issues. Only one of the sides, child developed forearm shortening as well as uh, ulna, uh, um, ulna growth. Uh, it was de novo or the cause. Which I couldn't find the cause nor that there was a, any history which could suggest this thing. Yeah, I've not seen it, but you're right. These patients tend to get discharged from the practice. So we see them up to a certain age and they get sent home and, and they'd have to come back with a problem like your patient came back. I don't. I, I have no explanation of why the owner would stop growing. 
Yeah, just uh, before we move on to the next topic, I would like uh, like to ask all of three, like if you see uh, 50 patients of radio ulnar synostosis, how many of uh, those patients, 50 patients, uh, you will operate? Yeah, Scott first. 10%. 10%, okay. I mean, uh, it's not, yeah. Yeah, please, please, yeah. Please. No, one more, um, one more. It tends to, so uh, again, it's, unilateral is different than bilateral, obviously, right? But if you look at the unilaterals, it's probably 10 to 15% because they can compensate with the other side. Bilaterals, probably still it's the majority because most of them tend to be fixed in a relatively good position. Now, as was mentioned here, cultural differences may make it more common for people to rotate in supination in India than they are in the States, which I understand. But for me, it's still the minority of patients I see with synostosis require surgery. Okay. Uh, Premil, in your practice... So, didn't we, what I have realized is the patients generally come to us when they have a significant issues. When there are minor issues here, we don't see the patients. So, as I agree, that if the patient is generally having urilateral, I will suggest them surgery. I will not hard sell them. We show them the pre-operative and post-operative videos of other patients and see that this is, the, this is what is the functional improvement you will get. And then they will decide whether come to come for a surgery or not. And in, in my experience, almost 80% are yes. In bilateral also, uh, I have operated uh, many cases which came back for second surgery in more than 50% of the cases. So in bilateral, we do the severe side first and then let patient decide whether they want the second side or not. It's only the adolescent generally when there's a bilateral, they go for one side surgery and they are happy. But uh, those who have come to the clinic had reasonably bad deformity, stuck in for pronation, not able to do their activity of daily living and hence uh, probably the surgical conversion is probably on a higher side. Okay. Can it be the reason that uh, those 50% of the patients with the bilateral cases are coming for the surgery on the second side? Means probably the first surgery has not met the expectations what they have. Could it be that be the reason? Generally, it's, we do it the severe side more and more, mostly the right side more because they have issues with eating because the food doesn't go well. And it, if, if you're doing with your hand, it is okay. But if you're doing with spoon, it is really bad. You have to hold the spoon like this. So that is their primary concern. So when they're able to accept prasad with the right hand and do this, generally they are very happy. Uh, but when there are younger kids, the conversion to bilateral surgery is far uh, more than in the older kids because they are habituated to uh, that uh, position for a longer period. Yeah, Edwin, what about you? Uh, Dhirambhai, my experience is diff uh, different. And in fact, to uh, know the indication of surgery, we have uh, given them the criteria. We asked the questions, 12 set of different questions. So if a child has uh, difficulty of more than performing more than four activities, and if by doing the evaluation, by uh, carrying on Morris test and Jepson Tell hand function test, you find that there is difficulty or the score is less than in, in even the two activities, there are difficulties, then that becomes an indication of surgery. And believe me, trust me, um, I, 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 I mean, my rate of uh, surgery is completely opposite to the Scott. That he said 10% he will operate. <laughs> In my <laughs> experience, 90%, more than 90% will operate. It's like that because it gives a quality of life. It gives a quality of life to our patients. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, a quick comment. It'd be great if, if if you would share with us those questions. We don't have a questionnaire that we use to rely upon. Yeah. But I think so would be great. And it's interesting how I think a lot of patients come to see me that the parents just want to know what it is. Right. They just, it was picked up incidentally on an x ray and they just want to know what it is. They don't, they tend to come to me when they're little because we're a kids' hospital and they just want to know what is this? What is going on? My child's having trouble reaching underhand. It's fascinating to me how that can be such a discrepancy how many we operate versus how many you guys operate. But I think it's based upon referral. I don't think it's based upon indications. I think our indications are fairly similar. It's just a referral pattern. Right. Viraj, I have a question for you because I am getting very young patients to operate and my um, my indication to operate is at about two and a half years of age now uh, because it's very easy. So in, in those kids to perform uh, this test which you described is really difficult. So do you wait till the age where they can 
safely perform this occupation uh, I mean this uh, ot test uh, or suppose if patient comes earlier and if they want surgery they stuck in for and they feel that the child is little different will you offer a surgery yeah if if the child has difficulty in more than four activities because jepson tell a hand function test the standard is about 6 years right so there are some um, i mean they have given some points where below 6 if you are doing then then you have to consider all these things so most of the times you don't need to go into depth of that if the child has difficulty and the parent says that the child is having difficulty in so many activities we go ahead and we do it and preferably we go ahead about 2 and 1/2 years of the age group and i i recommend them that uh, operate as early as possible before you need a fixation you know so because the surgery is very simple it is like that okay fine so let's move on to the next topic and uh, after that again we will have a discussion yes scott your second lecture okay let me just share this again meanwhile i would like to just make a comment while scott is sharing my rates of surgery are like scott's 10% i'm not very biased towards doing the operation i try to discourage most of the patients because they are functionally well compensated they really don't need the surgery they are interested in finding out if there is somebody who can restore rotation which is not possible Okay, Darren. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. So the uh, the second topic uh, tonight over there and this morning over here is a madlung deformity, and this is interesting. So this has really changed the way we practice over time. So we've moved to, to complex reconstruction, which I'll share at the end. But in general, most of the adolescents present with a wrist deformity, primarily a prominent ulna. It's more common in female, which I'll talk about because it's Larry Wild dyschondriostosis, and it's often asymptomatic again in our patient population. Differential diagnosis includes those kids with Larry Wild dyschondriostosis, which is a mesomelic dwarfism. They tend to be short, more common in females. It's inherited as an autosomal dominant. It can have tibial bulging and can have scoliosis. Uh, this is the classic picture of Larry Wild kids. So on the right side of the screen, you see a family affected, and on the left side is one of my patients that you can see has a short stature, forearms a little bit short, both ulna are slightly prominent. Differential diagnosis is always important. Obviously, MAG can present like a Madelung's like deformity. A growth plate arrest, as you see on the right, can lead to an ulnar positive variance and appear to be Madelung's. in this wrist which is just con chronic compression of the radius the big take home point is none of these have a vicker's ligament so they're not true madelungs with reference to true madelungs about 85% of them have what's called a vicker's ligament which is an anomalous hypertrophic short radial lunate ligament so instead of the ligament originating from the epiphysis it originates from the metaphysis and crosses the growth plate It, it can connect in a variety of different positions distally, but what it does, it tethers that physis. So it tethers the radial physis along the ulnar side and the volar physis, and that leads to the deformity because the tether increases the inclination of the radius and pulls the radius into relative flexion. Physical examination, like I said before, is a prominent ulna. In general. Wrist flexion is greater than wrist extension. Why? Because the radius is tilted in a volar direction. There are positive signs of ulna abutment before the ulna escapes. Now, once the ulna escapes, it's often asymptomatic. But look at all this wrist flexion. That's way more wrist flexion than wrist extension. And again, it's all related to the tilting of the radius. Uh, plain X-rays are always the initial study. Advanced imaging studies, like an MRI, is important to ascertain whether a Vickers is present or not. Plain X-rays. Here's your distinctive finding: is this flame-shaped notch in the metaphysis? That's the origin of Vickers, and the Vickers ligament extends from that flame-shaped notch somewhere into the carpus, tethering the radial growth plane. There are tons of radiographic parameters described. Uh, honestly, in our clinical practice, we don't measure them routinely. Now, these are primarily, I think, if you're looking at your patients from a research or outcome standpoint. But clearly, there's ulnar and dorsal curvature of the distal radius. There's increased inclination of the distal radius. There's triangulation of the corpus with proximal and volar migration of the lunate, and makes sense. But there's prominent dorsal subluxation of the radial head. 
there are all these measurements. I'll run through them fairly quickly because I don't think they're as clinically relevant as we believe. But there's your ulnar tilt, which is defined according to this definition here. There's lunate subsidence, which is also a good research tool. Lunate fossa angle, which just shows how tilted or how tethered the lunate fossa is from Vickers ligament. Pommel carpal displacement, as you see here, measured in distance in millimeters between the longitudinal axis of the ulna and the most volar surface of the lunate or the capitate. And then the palmar tilt, which we're familiar with. Advanced imaging studies, we routinely obtain these studies, which looks for a Vickers ligament. As I said, it's present 85% of the time. Here's an example of an x-ray on your left and Vickers ligament on your right, and both in a coronal view and axial view. What's the treatment for matalungs? If it's a mild deformity that is asymptomatic, they need to be observed, but they need to be followed up to make sure that the Vickers doesn't cause further tethering of the radial physis. If there's progressive or mildly symptomatic deformity and they're young, and young to us means in women, they have not menstruated as yet, we primarily release Vickers ligament, epistiolysis, and stick in some fat, as you see on the right side, and see whether or whether or not that portion of the radial physis can recover. Here's an example of a Vickers ligament reconstruction. It's a quick operation. It's done distal to the pronator quadratus through a longitudinal transflexal carpi radialis approach. It takes about a half hour or so. If there's an established deformity in a late adolescence and they're symptomatic. Now, symptomatic can mean number one, they hurt, or two, they don't like the appearance. We're going to perform some form of dome osteotomy and release of Vickers ligament. And then we're going to assess the ulna. And we'll go through this in a second. The technique, this is the technique from Texas Scottish Rite described by Mary Beth Izaki. And the dome is shaped here in a smile shape, as you see here. So there's a ligament release, a dome osteotomy. You want to reduce the distal fragment, which I'll show in a case example. And uh, Mary Beth and Peter Carter were preferring pin fixation. We prefer plate and screw fixation. And then you wanted to breed the volar lip of the radius. Here's your dome osteotomy being shifted back. And here's K-wires. And here it is in the sagittal. And you can see the ginormous correction obtained from the dome osteotomy. Here's one a case of ours. Of ours. This is Lily, 11-year-old female with a right dorsal prominence six months ago, active basketball player, minimal pain, but progressive deformity. A range of motion, like I stated before, tons of wrist flexion and limited wrist extension comparing the right side to the left side. Supination and pronation was full and symmetric. Here's her x-rays. Not a terrible deformity, but you can see the ulna starting to escape on the lateral. Our intervention, our surgical plan was to release, volar uh, release Vickers ligament and perform a dome osteotomy, and then to address the ulna by an episodesis. Here's our approach, like we described earlier. We release the pronator quadratus, reflect in an ulnar direction, expose the distal radius, and release Vickers ligament. Here's an intraoperative picture. Uh, we prefer our osteotomy shaped as a frown instead of a smile. Uh, the reason we prefer that configuration was we're less likely to get into the distal radial ulna joint with a frown compared to a smile. If there's any question, you need to bring in fluoroscopy, which can be extremely helpful, making sure you stay out of the distal radial ulna joint with your osteotomy. And we perform the osteotomy with K-wires and then curved osteotomes, as you see here. So the K-wires mark the trajectory of the osteotomy, and then the osteum com osteotome completes the osteotomy. Then you place your thumb on the distal fragment, and you push, and you apply radial deviation. So the dome is corrected in multiple planes, both in the coronal alignment and in the sagittal alignment when you push distally and dorsally on that fragment. And here's the correction you obtain. So this is Lily on the left prior to dome. And this is after the dome with just my thumb holding it in a reduced position. Notice the diminished ulnar prominence. In terms of fixation, like I said before, we've kind of gotten away from the K-wires as we've gotten better with plate and screw fixation. The K-wires are big and they're irritant and they're close to the radial sensory nerve. So when we can, we prefer to have a small plate and screw configuration for internal fixation. And then you want to check the x-rays, make sure you're okay with your correction. This isn't 100% corrected, but still much better than prior to surgery. Then with reference to the ulna and lily, 
we performed an ulnar pisidesis. We tend to do this by placing a cannulated drill into the physis. So this is the K wire into the growth plate first, followed by the cannulated drill. And once we drill out the cartilage, as you see here, we're going to replace it and put in a small curette to complete our pisidesis. If the ulna is really long, we'll perform a formal ulnar shortening with plate and screw fixation. In Lily's case, we just did a pisidesis. Uh, our outcome in general, without too much science, is that our Vickers release is have been variable, meaning sometimes they're able to recover their radial growth and sometimes they're not. Our dome has been much more reliable with a correction that you can see here from the left to the right. What are our practice trends? And this is myself and Helen who visited us and my new partner, Eugene Park and Dan, Dan C, who most of us know on the call. We have really pushed toward 3D modeling. This has been one of our biggest changes in practice. It's provided us with a better understanding of the deformity. I think a better deformity correction, especially those really severe matalungs. In terms of outcome, we don't know. We just haven't been doing it long enough. But let me show you two examples. Uh, this is Jasmine with his 18 year old female with bi -matal bilateral matalungs. Uh, this is the left side, and this is the right side. Pretty substantial deformity, a lot of curvature on the left side, and a lot of curvature on the right side. Here's our surgical planning. Again, we tend to use Materialize. I have, I have no relationship to Materialize. I think you can use that, use whatever 3D modeling that you use. The child has bi bilateral CT scans. You perform the surgical correction comparing the normal to the abnormal, or they have a bank of normals. And then you do the operation with the engineer virtually. Then they send you the jigs that you've decided to use. They send you the lens of the screws. You pick whatever hardware as long as they had the CAD drawings for the hardware. And then you perform these massive corrections using this materialized surgical planning technique. And here's the left side with marked improvement in the alignment. But I can't do that surgical correction without 3D modeling. I'm not smart enough to understand the deformity. And we've learned from 3D modeling, a lot of times it's not just the radius. The ulna is frequently involved, even though we're taught it is a radial deformity. Here's one more example, then I'll quit. 18 year old with bilateral again, left worse than right. Here's the right side. Here is the left side. Here's our surgical planning. Again, this was done using materialized 3D reconstruction. And since it was bilateral, we used a, the bank of normals for 18 year old females. And here's our planned surgical correction. They also send you a book, which is step-by-step and the most important person in the operating room is not the surgeon, it's the person with the book, right? Because you have to follow it step by step. You have to do exactly what the surgical planning is, or you will mess up the technique that you designed prior to surgery. So look at this complex surgical correction. Again, I couldn't figure this out without 3D planning. And here's the result on the left side. And that's a considerable improvement. So we've gotten much better at understanding the deformity and we've gotten much better with our 3D modeling. And I do think our outcome and results will be better. Here's our follow-up. Again, not 100% correction. And sometimes you don't need 100% correction, but clearly marked improvement in the radius and a little bit of ulnar realignment. And that to us is just a home run. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, the first question before we go uh, for the Premel's case, uh, you did a double radial osteotomy. The distal osteotomy is connection for the distal alignment. What is the purpose of proximal radial osteotomy? Yeah, it's a great question because there is proximal radial deformity, right? So there are those, this, I mean, it sounds weird because I, I know this whole concept of madelungs just being a distal deformity, it's, it's not really true. There's this whole bone, you know, that you see sometimes in Larry Wilde discondustosis, and there is this proximal deformity that I never, ever appreciated prior to the 3D modeling. I thought it was simply a distal phenomenon, but it's not. And sometimes, and there's not as much proximal deformity as you think, but you can't get all the correction of the deformity distal. It would be too massive of a correction. So then we just play with it on the computer back and forth, back and forth, and figure out what is the best way to obtain alignment. 
Because you have to remember the engineers aren't surgeons and sometimes they'll have you cut the bone where you can't even get to the bone. So you have to say, no, no, I can't get, I can't get there. There are all sorts of things in the way. So we just go back and forth, back and forth until we have ample correction. But I am shocked at how much proximal deformity we found for sure. Okay. And the second question is like when you correct so much of uh, like angular deformity at the distal radius, uh, whether the distal radial nerve joint restrain the correction? Yeah, it depends. If they're way out, it really doesn't restrain the correction. The ones that are located can restrain the correction. I agree 100%. Okay. And the two cases which you showed, in the first case, uh, there was a lot of uh, opening. Means like uh, it was not a complete closing uh, of yes. the deformity. While in the second, there was a good uh, apposition of two fragments. Yeah. Yeah, so the most why, why there was a difference between the two? It's just the more severe deformities, it's difficult to get primary coaptation of the bone. That's the big reason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Aaron, as we keep going, I'm just going to drop this paper off to my secretary. Keep going. I'll come right back. Yeah. Okay. Raymond, please. So I think I'm going to uh, show you a case which was which is nearly different than which has been described earlier. And it, it has both the deformities as mentioned earlier as well. So this is a combination of uh, these two as the Rinvai has already said. So 11 year female came with uh, deformity uh, on left wrist region. She had, uh, she had knew this for the last three months. And there was a significant forearm anterior bowing. And uh, that bowing was maximum in the mid shaft. She had a hyperpronation of 20 degree. She could come to neutral and there was a 20 degree supination. Left forearm was shorter. Palmer flexion was uh, uh, restricted uh, um, by 20 degrees. And right forearm also opposite side also had a mild radial bowing uh, and terminal supination restricted. Uh, this is how she was uh, in 2014. If you can uh, appreciate here, there's a significant radial bowing here and uh, there's a significant shortening also on the on both the forearms as you can see on both the sides. And uh, this is her uh, issues. And you can see the left side uh, palm of flexion is restricted and uh, you can see the supination is also restricted. And if you look at the x-ray, you will be able to notice why you need a osteotomy of the radius at this level. And there is an issue here also. The major issue is our concentration is here, but the patient wanted correction here. So I could convince that child to undergo MRI. And we found, as Scott said, this uh, there was a there was a teetering, and this is the ligament of Wicker, which you can see here in in both the views. And uh, this is the another view of the same thing, and, and there was a small bar here. So I thought we'll be able to describe excise this. But if you look at this X-ray uh, carefully, this is not a normal uh, made lung. This is basically a reverse made lung, where your Wicker's ligament is situated on the posterior side and not in the anterior side. So I have uh, two cases of reverse medulla. So this is a case of reverse medulla. So I first undertook a forearm surgery on the left side. Uh, what I uh, did was here, um, I um, did an anterior close wedge osteotomy first on the with the anterior approach where the patient was symptomatic and posteriorly I opened uh, and uh, removed the posterior vicus ligament, um, reached the growth plate uh, and uh, tried to do epiphyseal lysis. Uh, like this and put some fat, hoping that something would grow. And uh, as um, Scott mentioned, uh, it, it really looked better um, on a diaphyseal side, but uh, on there was no growth on the epiphyseal side after some time. So this was about her one year follow up. You can see her palmar flexion has significantly uh, improved. Her supination also has improved and she has a much better looking forearm compared to earlier. And you can see there's a dorsal scar also here. So now that um, she had some issues with distal radius, um, I went ahead uh, and uh, removed the plate, did a distal radial osteotomy with posterior translation or anterior translation of the uh, distal radius. And at the same time, I uh, did uh, ulnar epiphyseal disease as advised by Dr. Cousin. And this is her uh, radiological follow-up. There is looking much better. And uh, this is her functional follow-up uh, uh, six months down the line. And this is where she had mild symptoms on the left side. We continued observing her. But then after she was, uh, she gained good movements about uh, two years down the line, uh, she, she was lost to follow up. 
So I just broke, brought this case to show my failure of doing epiphyseal lysis uh, and excision of the weaker ligament only, and to show that uh, the deformity could be proximal as well, which was very well shown by Scott Cousin. In 2014, I did not have access to 3D modeling. Then it is available now in India, but there is a cost added, so not applicable to all our patients. So I think if you cannot do it in one surgery, there is no problem doing it, do it in two stages. Scott, your reviews on this case. Yeah, so it's a just it's a great segue, Pamela. It's just what we spoke about before. And the, number one, the proximal deformity. It's crazy, right? There's a lot of proximal deformity. And as I said before, the more we 3D model these kids, the more we learn how much deformity is apparent. It's it's a, the second thing, we have only had a few cases of the reverse metal lungs. And at least in our patients, they tend to be the Larry Weil kids with the yeah. dyschondriosis. But uh, we have seen it. I, I don't really understand. I don't actually understand why 85% of these kids have a, a Vickers. You would think it'd be 100%, but it's not the case. And and the, and the third point, though, is exactly what we mentioned before. Epiphysiolysis will work, but it has to be in these very young kids with very mild deformity. And Sebastian Farr has shown his best results with epiphysiolysis are those kids that are picked up literally by siblings of someone who's mad along. So they're Larry Wild kids. He gets, they get x-rayed, they pick them up. Before there's that crush and damage to the physis, he releases them, they recover. I think that's, the, that's your only real chance. Otherwise, there's too much damage to the physis for it to truly recover. Now, I love that. That is a great case presentation. And it's just an honest appraisal of what we find with our Vickers ligament release. It doesn't always work. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other like uh, thing which you would like to show, like uh, you mentioned about some book, uh, which the manual which you said during the surgical procedure we, uh, was that me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, uh, like you said that uh, you carry out uh, board modeling and then you follow step by step. So why you really rely on that uh, uh, manual? Uh, because once you have a jig, you can definitely... Uh... No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Let me tell you why. Because the jig has to be put on the bone in the precise position. You're exactly right, right? So you they will tell you exactly where to put it onto on the radius or on the ulna and you can't be off. So if you look at the jig, it says proximal distal. So you have to check that a thousand times, make sure proximal is proximal and distal is distal, right? And if you say you're going to put the jig on whatever, 10 centimeters from the radial styloid, it has to be 10 centimeters from the radial styloid. And if you're off just a little bit with reference to your rotation or your distance, all your cuts will be off, especially on the ones I showed with multiple cuts because each cut is based off the uh, the previous cut. Yeah, I know. Because I, I've unfortunately, I've done it where I've put it on a little bit off and then nothing works and everything falls apart, right? And the same holds true. We're starting to use a lot of 3D modeling for our mismontages because, again, there's a lot of secondary deformity that's hard to figure out. I, I also think then is that we're using it on our both bone form malunions, especially in kids because they remodel. And I, what we're seeing is that the old adage that after two years, you shouldn't really correct the malunion is not really true. I think what's true is after two years, we're not smart enough to correct it because there's been so much remodeling. But from, from the modeling, we know that we can now at least put the bones where they need to be. So I, I, I know it's a little bit of an expensive technology, but I think it is improving our understanding of these deformities Right. So, I mean, I, it'd be interesting to take the case that Primo showed and model it. And I wonder what the model would come out compared to the way he corrected the osteotomy. Fascinating. Okay. So, thank you once again, uh, Scott, for joining. I know that you are in middle of the your uh, outpatient, but uh, we are really lucky and we are thankful to you for sparing time and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. So, can I, can, I, can I make one more comment? Because I, I just, I, I texted you this, right? right? I really enjoy this. I mean, I, I really enjoy the collegiality um, and I really enjoy interacting with all the people on the panel and everybody over in India. It's just a heartwarming thing to do. So it, it's, it is absolutely positive and my pleasure to participate. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Thank you. And uh, thank you once again, Premal and Viraj, for sharing thank your you own everyone. technique or the innovative technique. Thanks very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.